Good day to everybody. We are very pleased that you can join us today for this uh, first virtual town hall of UWC Dilijan. Most of us uh, are very concerned about their health, about their families. So my first wish today is for everybody to be safe, yourselves, your families, and your communities. My name is Pierre Gurdjian. I am uh, one of the governors of the school, and I've had the privilege of uh, joining the board several years ago when the school started its operations. I am Belgian. I'm the president of the Free University of Brussels, Université Libre de Bruxelles, and I'm also closely associated to a number of philanthropic uh, initiatives around <clears throat> the founders of the school, Veronica Zonabend and Ruben Vredanian. Today, our objective is twofold. The first one is essentially to open up a new channel of communication between the school community and the school leadership and the board. This is the first of a town hall meeting, a virtual town hall meeting, and there will be additional sessions every week. Second, today, we would like to engage on a number of topics of substance, highly relevant, to the current situation of the school. First, we would like to hear from a expert in public health, Lucy Telfer Barnett. Lucy is joining us from New Zealand. She's a distinguished professor and researcher at the University of Ontago in Wellington. She is herself a graduate of UWC Pearson College, if I'm not mistaken, and the proud mother of Phoebe, who graduated from Diligen last year. Thank you very much, Lucy, for being here. Second, we will turn to the current situation of the school and particularly all of the measures that have been taken over the last weeks and are still being um, managed by the school leadership. And we will welcome uh, Gabriel, Gabriel Abad, known to everybody as the headmaster of the school and with his team extremely engaged in making sure that what is happening now <clears throat> doesn't weaken the school and actually even reinforces the school. <clears throat> Finally, we will turn to the board of governors of the school as ultimate stewards of the future of the school. I will hear from Veronica Zanabend, chairwoman of the board, also founder with her husband, Ruben, of the school, in many ways, our spiritual leader and she will talk about um, how the board is uh, looking at the situation today and more specifically or more generally speaking uh, express some commitment and confidence about the future the way we'd like to conduct this session is fairly straightforward we will limit it to one hour although we could imagine that Given the topics and the people we have on the panel, we might be spending much more time, but we will keep it to maximum one hour. We will hear in turn from each of the panelists, and then there will be room for a few questions that you can address to us um, through the link that is provided, and we will select a number of questions that we can address today. Those questions that will not be addressed will be answered and we'll come back at the end of this session on how you will be able to consult the answers to those questions and of course communicate additional questions if necessary with this in mind i would suggest lucy to give you the floor and speak about uh, the pandemic and how this pandemic is affecting uh, the world of education and perhaps uwc Thank you very much, Pierre. It's a, a real privilege to be able to, to speak to everyone today. Um, if the sound gets too quiet, please let me know. Just raise a, a hand or something. Um, now, I'm, I thank you for that, that kind introduction. I'm, I'm here to speak as, as an epidemiologist. Um, I've been working in infectious respiratory disease research throughout my public health career, and I'm now part of two working groups advising the New Zealand government on its response to COVID-19. So I'm, I'm well immersed in the topic. But this afternoon, I'm going to start you off with just some brief background on COVID-19 and then talk about the challenge that the virus presents for UWC and education in general. 
So as you will be aware, COVID-19 is the name given to a novel coronavirus, which was first passed amongst humans in Hubei province in December last year. Since those first cases, it's now spread to almost every country and has infected well over 2 million people with around 127,000 deaths so far. Coronaviruses are a group of respiratory diseases, which include milder illnesses like the common cold and also more severe illnesses like SARS and MERS. When COVID-19 was first identified, it was really easy to think of it as being a very severe and contagious flu, because many of the symptoms are similar, a sore throat, a fever, a dry cough. Lots of countries, including my own, had developed plans for pandemics of influenza after the 2007 swine flu pandemic. So they dusted off those plans and, and started to put them in place. One of the first things you do in a serious influenza epidemic is you close schools. Children are very good at spreading flu. They catch it really easily. And then when they're at school together, they spread it amongst themselves. And then they take it home to their families. So in 2007, with the swine flu epidemic, New Zealand's levels um, of swine flu dropped to just back to usual winter flu levels when our winter school holidays started, just as a demonstration of, of why school closures were one of the first things that happened. So when COVID-19 appeared, because it seemed to be behaving so much like a flu, closing schools to reduce transmission was a, a very rational and sensible first step, one which most countries took amongst the various first control measures as the virus struck, even before they started heavier lockdowns. For UWC, this was a huge challenge. Um, in some cases, although the school was closed, boarding facilities were treated as home and we were allowed to keep the students living there. Whereas for other UWCs, the boarding facility couldn't be effectively locked down. And so as many as students as possible needed to leave. And meanwhile, along with closing schools, countries had also started trying to prevent more cases arriving by closing borders. So over a period of really just a few weeks, more and more UWCs were faced with decisions about when and how to close. And for those that needed to close their boarding facilities fast, um, there was a lot of hectic and stressful work needed between the colleges and national committees and the international office working together to get those students home as, as quickly and safely as possible in amongst borders closing, flights being cancelled, transit options disappearing and so on. The one relief through all of this was that the numbers coming out of, of China mostly at that stage were showing that although COVID was definitely killing people, the risk for children and for young people was apparently really small. So although we were very cautious and concerned for older staff members, we were reasonably confident that students themselves were not likely to be badly affected by the virus, particularly while the case numbers re remained low in, in the college countries. So now I'm just going to try sharing my screen. I hope this is going to work. Um, just because I've got a few graphs and so on, I'll try not to make it too complicated. Right. Yeah. Okay, so mm. Ooh, not that one. <laughs> right, so if we start here, you can see that the case fatality rate by age for COVID-19, it's really skewed towards the elderly population at the bottom of the graph here. So even um, now, it's really looking like the case numbers and deaths for people under 20 remain really low. We have got a few deaths in those zero to nine years, but not many at all. That's pretty much what influenza looks like for deaths as well. But when we look at the age distribution of cases, um, the case numbers in under 20s are also really low. It's only once you get over, over into the 20 years plus that you start to see the rise in case numbers. And that's where there's a real difference between COVID-19 and influenza. Because when you look at flu, 
it looks like this. You have a lot of young people catching it and less elderly people, even though those elderly people are much more likely to die. And that difference is important because of what it may mean for UWCs being able to open again before we have a vaccine. So this map that you can see here is a bit out of date now. Um, more and more countries are in full lockdown. While we watch case numbers to see how well the lockdowns are working, we're also thinking about how we can safely come out of, again from, from lockdown. Part of that is wondering what that might look like for schools reopening. So at the moment, we have only one in 10 of um, school pupils worldwide are in school because schools have been closed everywhere. But a recent modelling study has, or and evidence review has found that school closures alone are will only prevent about two to four percent of deaths. Other interventions that we do to control COVID-19 are more likely to be more effective. And given that there is a huge social and economic cost from closing schools, there is a chance that after lockdowns have been relaxed, that countries may be more reluctant to go to close schools again as, as they need to control cases again. So there is a chance there that, that colleges may be able to remain open. That's the hope anyway. The other challenge, of course, for UWC is border closures. Um, much of the world has travel restrictions now. You're not allowing foreign nationals to enter, or in some cases, even to transit. And as a result, airlines have closed. Many international travel routes are now unavailable. And even where borders remain open um, or are opened up again, it may take a while for airlines and travel routes to recover. So getting students to UWC is going to be difficult. So now we have this really attractive slide, <laughs> which is kind of looking at what, what are our options here. If schools are open, but borders are closed, then you may be able to have local students. If schools are open um, and, and borders are open, then you may get your full cohort. If you just have the local students or if borders and schools are closed, then you may be looking at that online teaching. But that, that then raises those issues around barriers through of technology, time zones, what you do about science labs and art and drama and CAS. And also that question of what that means for UWC as experiential education, which I'm sure that other people better uh, qualified in that space we'll talk about later. And I'm just going to finish with this one slide on, on the ongoing challenge, really, for, for all of countries with UWCs in them, which is that those countries are going to continue to try to, to need to prevent peaks in case numbers. Most countries are not in a position where they can try to wipe out the virus altogether, as, as China has really effectively done, and, and as New Zealand is trying to do. So they will be needing to raise and lower controls as virus case numbers go up and down. And we don't know yet what that will mean for UWC staying open through a school year. The question then will be how to continue to provide the special kind of education that we do in that kind of challenging situation with restrictions coming and going. Um, and that seems like probably a good time to pass on to the, the educationalists and people thinking about how we do that. So I think I'll end there. I'm happy to take some questions first. Though. Thank you very much, Lucy. Uh, very, very clear and very concise presentation. Uh, perhaps a few, a few questions that uh, people are uh, suggesting. Um, one, one is actually, I believe, very close to your own area of expertise and research around uh, seasonality and, and, and how this kind of pandemic can or would not be affected by climate and what this would then say around the propagation of the phenomenon. Yes. So uh, with other coronas, the coronaviruses, there is seasonality observed. But we don't know for COVID-19 whether that 
seasonal effect will be seen or whether there will be some other temperature effect. So perhaps it's less likely in the tropics than in the temperate zones. There isn't enough evidence to say yet. The one thing that I do note is that although influenza is a seasonal illness in general, when the 1918 pandemic came through to the Southern Hemisphere, it arrived in December, which is summer for us, and we still had a devastating epidemic. So we can't rely on season alone to end it. Thank you, Lucy. Another uh, health-inspired question uh, is uh, somebody wondering if apart from a future vaccine, if there are other ways that people, and, and, and I assume also young people, can improve their uh, immunity uh, towards the virus? Uh, not really, you know, stay healthy, eat good food, get exercise, um, get plenty of sleep. <laughs> Those are really the, the best things that you can do to, to keep your immunity up. Um, other than that, there is no magic potion, unfortunately. More general question. This is coming from me listening to, um, to your story in terms of how the UWC movement is uh, uh, preparing for this. Um, what kind of uh, expertise is the movement uh, being able to leverage? And are you yourself involved in helping UWC think about these phenomena? Yes, so the International Office um, has a, a group that are providing strategic advice and then it has a subgroup of um, epidemiologists and, and doctors, which myself and um, Professor Kike Basat of Barcelona and also Dr. Marina Macciola of Italy. And so we consult with each other on, on the advice that we provide to the International Office on the health aspects of, of the pandemic and what that means for schools. Good, that is reassuring. Here's another very uh, specific health-related question, which I'm just throwing to you. Somebody wondering um, about the, the time that would be needed to develop famous uh, herd immunity or collective immunity for, to, to the virus? Unknown, I think, is, is the, um, the first matter. At that, that last slide that I showed where, where you have that little up and down curve, that is really, that will eventually get you to herd immunity, but no one's really looked at how long that will take. Uh, there are questions around what percentage of the population needs to be immune. There, initially, we thought it was about 60% but that was assuming a particular level of contagiousness. Uh, there is some modeling coming out of the US that suggests that it might be much more contagious, which means that you might need up to 80% of the population to be immune, and that then stretches out how long it takes to get there. But, um, but you don't want to get there fast, or it means that lots of people have died. That's the real. Thank you very much, Lucy. I will perhaps suggest now that we turn to Gabriel, and if we have some time, we'll come back to, to you. And thank you very much um, for already having provided this perspective. You're welcome, and I'm happy to contribute answers to the, the questions for the um, website as well. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you very much, Lucy. Gabriel, can you speak about how the last few weeks have been, what has been done, what keeps you awake at night? <laughs> well, first of all, I would like to start by thanking the college community, in particular the UWC staff, but not only that, the local authorities in Dilijan, the Armenian government, the diplomatic representations in Armenia and beyond that were instrumental in supporting us in dealing with a crisis that obviously no one was expecting. Um, when it became clear that COVID was going to become something well beyond China and that was going to go global, we started to prepare a scenario of what if, what happens if it comes to Armenia, what happens if it comes to Dilijan, what happens if it comes on campus. And we reached a point in which it became clear that we needed to de-densify the campus. We needed to have less students on campus so that if we became affected, we could support people with social distancing. We had already beefed up our clinic 
adding 17 additional beds in a separate space so we could contain. But we reached a point in which, unfortunately, we had to ask our first year students to go back home, hoping that we would be able to continue supporting our second years on campus on a much more diffuse campus, having a number of students in the rooms and so on. In order to do that, first thing we did is we organized the fastest graduation in the history of UWC Diligent. In 20 hours, we set up the graduation of a class of 2020, which was, as you can imagine, quite emotional because we finished graduation and we had buses outside already prepared to start shuttling students to Svarnots Airport. So that was a very tough time for the community in the sense that many students saw their experience in Diligent cut short by months. There were lots of uncertainty. And in a matter of days, it became clear that we would not even be able to support our second year students, irrespective of what happened. It was a time of uncertainty. What's going to happen with my exam? What's going to happen with my life? I don't have a flight. And we always put care at the forefront of what we do. The exams were secondary. By then, we were quite sure that the IB would cancel the IB exams because we had been working with the IB for weeks as a UWC movement, working very closely with them. And it became clear that even if the exams were to take place, they were totally secondary. So our operation Exodus meant that we moved 191 students in less than one week to over 60 countries all over the world. And once again, I want to thank my team for walking the extra mile. In some cases, I would say driving the extra mile. We had two staff members who drove 18 hours nonstop from Dillian to the Iranian border to deliver one of our students to the family at the other side of the Iranian border because it was the only safe way to do so. But we did that because of primary duties, a duty of care to the students that are entrusted to us. By the end of Operation Exodus, we had 35 students on campus who couldn't go home because the countries were no longer accepting nationals because we couldn't get them flights. We had a direct line with airlines and the airport in Armenia, and we were seeing the flights disappear slowly. So it was fantastic to be able to get 191 students. We had cancellation, change of tickets. We had teams in different cities all over the world, making sure that students connected. So in, in that sense, I have to also thank our fellow UWC national committees, our parents, our alumni who were instrumental in helping us, making sure that most of our students could be safely back home with the families. As soon as we completed that, we moved to the second phase, which is that priority is done. How do we support now our students, whether they are on or off campus? And we knew from the beginning that we wanted to support all needs. So we took two weeks to prepare a transition to a full online program for all of our students, including psychological and emotional support with individual appointments with our two psychologists and a university and careers advisor. So our students are being supported in all areas. They're missing the residential life experience that they would have on campus, but everything else, we're trying to do everything we can to make sure that they have the best possible experience. That means that we've had virtual TUM times. Just you know, TUM is the Armenian work from home. So our residences and house parents are having the usual weekly meetings, and some of them are blended with the students who are still on campus and the students who are all over the world. We've organized movie nights, sports activities on campus, pizza, baking sessions, everything we can to keep the community engaged and whenever possible, even opening it to those students who are not here. If you were able to visit a canteen right now, you would be surprised to see multiple students with different mobile phones playing the same song that they're singing to with the peers who are all over the world and they're using apps to have the same house party, the same experience of being celebrating together. And it's beautiful because it shows the resiliency of our community and how we're finding new ways to cope with something that is completely new for us. So in that sense, we're very proud of what the community is doing. The school was in a good place in order to support our students learning. We have moved to Google Suite for Education last summer. We have purchased Cognitive, which are interactive uh, online intelligent textbooks, and we have managed back. So we had all the systems ready to be able to move on. Our first year students are doing particularly well in making sure that they don't lose learning. Educational research says very clearly that a gap makes you lose what you learn. It happens every summer with the students on holidays. 
So for us, it was very important to make sure that we kept the learning going and that we kept doing different initiatives. For our second year students, it's different. Suddenly they got the message, there's no exams. There were celebrations and fireworks in cities all over the world with second year students seeing the light. They went from total drama to total acceleration. But the truth is there's still things that need to be done. Today's the deadline for submission of a lot of coursework to the IB. We have to make sure that that's done properly. Some students have to complete things like the art exhibition, which we're hosting on campus and virtually. The students have to do things like the performance for solos in theater arts. So our priority with the second years has been to make sure that they complete everything they need in order for the IB to be able to assess the work and then provide them with a diploma and a grade at the end. After that, we would like to find to take this as an opportunity to do some learning that is not constrained by IB requirements. So we're exploring some kind of project-based approach to the last weeks of the school so that students can do a project that could be COVID. It could be, I'm passionate about economics and art. I want to look at representations of COVID in art and the impact on economy. And it can be individual, it can be in groups. We're even exploring whether we can do it with other peers in other UWC schools and colleges to make this something more interesting. Um, the question is, so what's happening now? What's going to happen next? And I'm pretty sure that all of us are looking for crystal balls in Amazon or wherever we can. The truth is there's no certainty on what to do next. So we've been very active. We've been working with our board here in Diligent for over two weeks now in working groups, preparing different scenarios and different contingency plans. We've been working with the IB, with our fellow UWC schools and colleges. We've been working with the Council of International Schools and looking at what all the schools are doing and even universities. Some of you may have seen that Boston University this week started to drop the idea that students may not be able to go back to campuses until January. And at the moment we need to say may, might, because there's no certainty. But I want to send a very clear message to our whole community. The college is here for every one of our students and we'll do everything we have to do to make sure that they are supporting. We may not be able to give you a clear answer today on whether the campus gates will be open in August or October or will it be January 21? But whatever it is, we'll have the back of our students and we'll have a plan to be able to support them at all levels, educationally, emotionally, with the university applications and anything else they may need. And talking about students, I think it's a good time to invite Zach, who's one of our core representatives of the Student Council. I've invited him so he can deliver a message on behalf of the students. Thank you, Gabriel. Hello, everyone. A month ago today, our school community began the painful process of saying early goodbyes as students prepared to make their way home in light of extraordinary circumstances. In the month that has passed, what has transpired has made us students lend ourselves to reflection. Reflection which I believe has enriched our understanding of what makes our school the tight-knit community that it is. The sudden loss of proximity meant that attachment was more evident than ever. We asked ourselves how we were going to foster a sense of togetherness as we had throughout the year in a time of social distancing. We're grateful that in spite of this distance, the necessary measures to maintain the profound bonds that we have were taken. With our guidance counselor and student peer listeners always available, along with the virtual tune times that Gabriel mentioned, sustaining this unity has been at the forefront of this transition. This focus on well-being has been imperative to the shift to an online learning program. By far the greatest difficulty that we as students face is finding the motivation to perform in these trying times. Adjustment to this abrupt change in routine is made even more difficult once we consider all the logistical challenges that come with the already demanding workload. These include time differences, restrictions in movement, and limited face-to-face -face interaction that we have become so accustomed to. In this sense, the feedback system between administration and the student body is more important than ever, not only for our academic success, but also for the protection of our mental health. Having gone through a trial period over these past two weeks, we believe that we will continuously improve the way this is executed, as the administration has been proactive in soliciting student suggestions. The challenges posed by this pandemic have only highlighted our resilience. The resilience of faculty who work to preserve our learning experience, the, the resilience of staff who care for those who remain on campus, the resilience of our graduating class who, 
in spite of the cancellation of IB exams, continue to commit themselves to their learning and the resilience of incoming second years who now more than ever are determined to uphold our values. Thank you. Well done, Zach. You've summarized beautifully the sentiments that we're all experiencing. It is indeed trying times, but it's also time to be proud of the achievements of the community and what we can do when we stand together. As head of college, I'm very proud of you, all of our students and our staff. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, Zach. Very impressive uh, testimonial, Zach. Uh, Gabriel, many questions, of course, arise. And as you said, there is a lot of uncertainty, so no definite answer can be given today. But maybe a few angles in this, and maybe you can share what what is known and, and, and also just acknowledge that mm -hmm. things uh, are, are not clear. Uh, a question around the online education, how does it work? Zach was uh, highlighting a number of challenges that go with that. How are we addressing that and how are we learning from it? Well, the first challenge is when you have students across all different time zones. It's nighttime for Lucy and some of our families in British Vancouver, in British Victoria <laughs> will be waking up now. So we had to find a time for minimum synchronous activities that will obviously inconvenience some people, but that could work and move most of what happens to asynchronous, which is a total shift from focusing on the class to having a time where you can actually touch base and address questions and then offload, preload, postload, whatever you can. In that sense, we're learning like millions of schools worldwide that have, were given 40 hours, one week at the most notice to say you need to totally shift the way you do things. We had the advantage that we've got, there's lots of expertise We've been working with our fellow schools in Asia that went online earlier. So we took many other lessons we implemented. We set up a dedicated microsite for our students and parents where we've got all the instructions, timetables, tips on what to do, hyperlinks to every single system. So our students right now can access anything they can on campus. They can still access the library databases. That was a big logistical work to get it done. And now what we're doing is we're collecting feedback. We did a survey to all our staff and students last week after week one, and then we'll do another one soon to keep tweaking as we go through the experience to see what can we do better, what do we need to stop, or what do we need to add? Just a follow-up question on that, because you, you were referring to experiences of other UWC schools. Is there Are there any uh coordination mechanisms within uwc that help people understand best practices anticipate problems some of us i'm, I'm a confessed geek so some of the geeks in the movement set up a group that has been working on e-learning we've been looking at what platforms what tools what changes in pedagogy we currently have an online share guide that's openly available we share it with any school that wants it with all kinds of tips from what software has worked to how do we change what are the expectations how do you control the screen time, etc.? Yeah. Thank you. Another question relates to the Armenian environment and how Armenia as a country is dealing with the crisis and any anticipation that we can have around difficulties for uh, foreigners to travel back into the country. And any any anything that we could say about this today? We took the decision to lock down the campus before Armenia took any measures. So we've been on campus for a month now. Then Armenia started to put measures, ending up with a state of emergency where there's no travel curtail, you need a permission to be able to go somewhere else, and there's limitations. Armenia has been quite good in implementing measures with a very strong social focus. For example, shops are open in the morning for three hours, only for 65 years old and above, so they can do that at their own time with it being put at risk with other people. But the country's concerned and they've extended the state of emergency till mid-May. At the same time, they're having to cope with the financial impact of having shut down most economic activity. So like every other country right now, they're trying to find a balance of what can we reopen without suddenly having a spike that will damage our society. In terms of how does that impact the college, as of now, we know that the college will continue close as it is with online activities and supporting the 35 students who are on campus. But we have limitations. For example, there cannot be more than 20 people in one room at any given time. So even if we do an activity, 
we have, sometimes we have to do two parallel because we cannot have the whole community in one go. Looking forward, we're in close contact with the government to see, but right now they're considering all the scenarios. I'll give you an example. China and Armenia had signed a deal for no visa, a reciprocal arrangement, and that lasted days before it had to be canceled because it coincided with the explosion of COVID. As of now, there's no indication from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs on what measure they'll start to put. So what we're doing is we're considering plans. Do we need to quarantine people as they come back? Do we need to change the way we apply for visas? We're just preparing all of those because we don't know which one will be the case. And I assume we are in close contact with the government on this. And I assume they also acknowledge the very special character that we have given the diversity of nationalities. We are, because sometimes we present them with cases that they haven't even considered because it never happened to them. A student who is a refugee in a country that has no Armenian embassy trying to come to study in Armenia, the two countries are not even recognize each other. How do you do it? So I would like to see the faces of some of the civil servants in Yeram when they receive some of our letters. I think it could be quite entertaining. Thank you, Gabriel. Here's another question um, from somebody wondering if uh, among the contingency plans for the future, there would be a possibility for students to transfer between UWC schools to take into account travel restrictions. That's something that the UWC heads have been discussing since February when we didn't know which way this was going to go. Transfers are not as easy as they may seem because different schools have different subjects. And sometimes even if you have the same subject, the history that is taught here in Dilija is not the same history that students may be studying in Isaac, Japan. But as a movement, we have commitment is pretty clear. We will support all of our students and we find ways to make it work. So we will consider whatever we can do. If a student is in a country that does not allow the student to leave the country and there's a school there, that's an option. If a student cannot go back to the country where they were studying, but another country has a no visa deal and we can make it work, we will certainly look into that. Thank you, Gabriel. One last question and then we'll shift to Veronica. Uh, around universities, anything that we could say now, how are universities reacting in university admissions? Our students, as you can imagine, our second year students were panicking when we locked down the campus, what's going to happen? Will there be exams? Not. Some universities have been very proactive in contacting students saying, whatever happens with the IB, we'll make you an offer and we'll honor the offer. And here, I think that the most important thing is that we need to realize that many universities consider our UWC graduates as very, very special. That's why you get over 100 universities coming to Dilijan on a yearly basis to recruit our students here because they want them. So in that sense, globally, it's a very different situation. But UWC graduates are in a very lucky, in a very privileged position because those universities can meet them, make personal contact. We have a full-time university and careers counselor who's directly working with them. So we have not seen any dropout of the offers we receive. Our students are getting some fantastic news in terms of admissions. We don't have a full picture yet, but it's looking very, very good for a class of 2020. What we don't know is how many of them will be starting online or how many will defer. Will the financial help that universities give change because of the different financial situation? All of those details, we don't know. But I can tell you that right now, the picture is universities are continuing to accept our graduates very, very nicely. Thank you, Gabriel. That is actually very reassuring. Thank you, Gabriel. I will turn now to Veronica, chairwoman of the board, founder, Veronica. Yeah, thank you, Pierre. Thank you for moderating this session today. And uh, I hope that this meeting will help us not only grasp the enormity of the situation, but also understand where we are and where we might be going at the school. First of all, I want to express on behalf of the board um, deep gratitude to Gabriel and the whole team of UWC Diligent staff. Uh, who care for our students and the support of community members have given to each other and the loyalty shown towards the college has been outstanding and often beyond expectations. And uh, it is highly valued and appreciated. 
and we all are proud of them. I want also to express gratitude to our board members who are very committed and uh, uh, dedicated a lot of time to find the best way how to pass this, uh, go through this difficult time, but also to look for, look, looking forward and uh, also find solutions for the future and develop plans for our new re reality. And we, ex uh, we understand that only being together, all together with the board, team, parents, students, we can uh, go through and then thrive. I would like to say that we all should, their all decisions that were developed, we uh, go from, from uh, understanding that the world will not, uh, will not come back to pre-COVID situation. We have to accept that we will come, the norm that we used to consider as the norm will not come back and uh, it will be new norm. And the second that it is their um, uncertainty also is part of this new norm. So we have to accept this, that uncertainty is the new reality. And we have to develop, develop in ourselves new skills of being resilient, adaptive, and also look at this as the opportunity rather than threat. So that on the 25th, on the 28th of March, the board uh, um, uh, met to discuss crisis response strategies. And I want to um, update you on that. So that our priority as the community is safety and the quality of education uh, that we provide and we all accept it. Although UWCD relies on strong fundamentals, there is uh, much work ahead for us to, uh, to do and, there, and to, to develop best conditions as possible. And the board is working with the college leadership team to anticipate possible contingency plans and develop scenarios what will happen next year and beyond. With the leadership team, the board creating, uh, creating, created working groups that will prepare analysis and the plans in four different areas, areas capacity building, sustainability, fundraising, and communications. The vote will convene again on the 25th of April to review the work prepared by the different working groups and confirm the preferred scenario and prepare the course of action for the college future. And uh, I want also uh, to pay attention that all this work uh, we do together as we see in there, this um, crisis time also allowed us and uh, made us even closer than before. And uh, we all uh, understand that only through joint actions, the board and the college community shall be able to build up resilience for sustainable future. But talking also about sustainability, I want to express special thanks to the school supporters. Those who contribute to the schools financially allow the school to be really diverse community and have a diverse student body uh, where students is accepted on merit and not on ability of the family to afford tuition fee, though we try to make to do quite tough financial assessment over ability of the families to give more opportunities to uh, the students whose families are unable to financially contribute. And uh, I should uh, say that in 2019-2020, uh, fifth anniversary year, we have been running a special campaign for scholarships with the goal of raising $5 million. And we almost fulfilled this plan. And there also, 
again, thank you to our supporters. So we still uh, see that almost all commitments would be fulfilled. We have to raise another 400,000 and we hope that we will complete the plan by the end of May. And there also, I want to say that board and the founders are deeply committed to the college and its community, working hard to ensure a sustainable and exciting future in, in which the college will continue to prosper and make a difference in the lives of many and us of the world. And there, uh, it is important to emphasize that this hard time was a very good test for our values and also values of, uh, of uh, high quality and uh, uh, human values and uh, uh, strong values of the community, of the supporters, of the parents. When we stand shoulder to shoulder and are resilient to and believe in a prosperous future, and they are ready for to meet this hard time. And they're also coming back to initial, uh, so the mission and vision when the college was created. We had this dream, which seemed to be unrealistic at, there. at that time, it was about 10 years ago, to create an international school in, in Armenia and the idea was to open Armenia to the world and bring world to Armenia. And uh, now we see that uh, values that are uh, deeply rooted in Armenia, respect for knowledge and the importance of uh, family strong values. When people care about each other and we witness at the, in Dilijan, what happened during crisis time, that the whole school community showed itself as the caring family where interests and the safety of each child is a priority. So whatever plan we as the board and together with the management take for the next year, I assure you that it will be taken from the best interests of the children and also with their vision to retain people who are deeply committed to also to the future of, of the children, to the future generation, to their interests and to their happiness to those who will create, be uh, responsible for our world in the future. And they're also, please be prepared to be resilient. And there, it will be not easy time for all of us and for the whole world, but we are sure that we will be able to overcome it. So thank you for all of you for, for your attention and I'm prepared for the questions. Thank you very much, Veronica. Let me immediately build on the theme that you raised around the core values of the school. And there's, there's a very interesting question around um, the way that the college has to, through its unique educational approach, UWC and the unique signature of Dilijan to um, foster resilience and responsibility in arguably a more complex world. Would you be able to elaborate on that and how you see the core values of the school relate to that potential aspiration? Uh, thank you for this. It's from the very beginning, uh, Again, our vision was about to create their center of education, international uh, center of education with uh, which help and equips young 
people with necessary skills that are necessary for the future world. We uh, intuitively, uh, uh, we, we had an intuition that world moves in the direction where it is not, a, it, the, the, the main importance is not about their diploma and also even ability to be admitted to top universities, but more about their uh, skills and values that make uh, people thrive and explore themselves, know better themselves and find their natural talents. So then for the future, we believe that uh, what we can nurture in Dilija very well, that uh, one of the programs that we have in mind and hope to be able to develop, which in collaboration with the Aurora Humanitarian Initiatives, it's humanitarianism, that every leader of the future should have, first of all, high human, human values, and also to develop creative creativity. So then creative arts is very important part of also of experience in Dilijan, as well as the skills in their new world and which is much more technological and then their artificial intellect, robotics, and the other uh, technological subjects will be very important. And also entrepreneurial development of entrepreneurial skills. So then this, all these topics are in discussion now within the board together with uh, uh, the head of the college and the uh, uh, um, senior leaders of the college. And uh, we believe that in a sense, crisis will help us to start to experiment pilot the programs even quicker. Yeah, thank you, Veronica. Can, can, can I perhaps suggest that you elaborate a bit more on, I guess, the, um, the tension that any organization is dealing with uh, when when a sudden crisis is hitting. And that's a tension between preserving the existing and building something new. And as you say, you know, a crisis always uh, opens up new opportunities. At the same time, crisis is severely testing the resilience of what is existing. And, and that's a topic, how to manage this tension between preservation and renewal. Any, any thoughts you would like to share on that? Oh, yes, it's very complicated and challenging uh, task. And it's always their um, question of uh, where is the between stability and, and openness to new opportunities. Yes, now we are in the situation that we have to be resilient and understand that uh, the new reality and also at least the reality of the next two years will be less comfortable for all of us. So we used to live within like experience of maybe last 10, 20 years where uh, the one that people in, uh, in many areas were um, not, not we, we have to be all, all, their, all, all their communities will be stretched. So we have to be prepared to take more responsibilities and maybe with sometimes less, uh, 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 with, uh, with less benefits that we used to have. And what we try to develop and what, what our thinking within the board is to find this core that we want to retain and believe that it's very important to keep, and as I mentioned before, to retain the most committed people. And the core is about their care about the future and the interests 
of the uh, 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 of the future of our, or, or, or interest of the students of young people, and they're based on this strong platform to build, to experiment and build new uh, uh, new innovative programs and instruments. And the balance, it, it is essential to, to have balance between it because also being a parent and also having kids in boarding school uh, as well, use the parents care and their uh, worry about safetyness and about uh, comfort of your child. And at the same time, we have to prepare them to go out of comfort zone because their progress is impossible without, uh, is impossible if you are not prepared for that, for that. So we, now we try to find the right balance in it. And uh, hopefully after 25th, we will have more clarity about the way we want and the scenario we choose for the next year. But also staying flexible enough for some, because nobody knows, as Gabriel told, crystal ball doesn't exist and we don't know what, what to expect and nobody knows about their near, especially nearest future. Thank you, Veronica. I see that we're almost reaching the hour. I would like, um, perhaps to close by repeating the deep appreciation we have for your presence as participants to this town hall. The school can only be as good as the support that it gets from the wider community, alumni, parents, friends, UWC, friends, board members. So we deeply appreciate it for your presence, for your questions, for your challenges and the deep um, commitment we have to continue this engagement. I would like, again, uh, as Veronica said, to extend a very warm appreciation as well to the school uh, leadership team and all the teachers and all the staff members who have made, uh, who have made possible the extraordinary response to the crisis and recognizing the, recognizing the hard work that is now being, being done. As Veronica was saying, the board is uh, in a high mobilization mode. I think the board is meeting online two or three times a week at this moment in a spirit of um, taking advantage of perhaps a very challenging moment, but a moment that will be defining in terms of an extraordinary future for the school. Lucy, thank you for having beamed in from far away New Zealand. Uh, I, I saw that you were able to answer a number of scientific questions while the session was uh, ongoing. We hope that we can continue to rely on your scientific support and, of course, parental uh, support as a parent of one of our alumni. Gabriel, I'm going to give you the last words if you would want to uh, express any closing thoughts and perhaps a very practical point as well pointing our participants for today to uh, concrete sources of information on points of contact. There are many questions that have been expressed that we have not been able to answer, some of them highly specific. And so perhaps last words to you. So first, thank you all. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you, Lucy. What we'll do is we will contact every person who raised her and sending a link to the microsite we created specifically for the crisis in which we will inbuild the video for the session and we'll do an FAQ. So any question that we didn't have a chance to address, we'll list them there and address the answers. We'll also put there the head email address, head at uwcdiligent.am that you can use to contact us anytime. And in case of emergency, the UWCD emergency phone is on 24 seven and that's plus 374-98146. Zero nine eight. That senior member of campus always has the phone. So in case of an emergency, you can always contact us over there. And I'll go back to what Pierre said. Thank you all, because like the African poor accepts, it takes a village to raise a child. So to raise a village of 226 teenagers takes a much bigger village. 
So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Be safe and let's talk soon. Thank you.